Before we, I hand over to Daniel and Tim to un, unpack the various treasures of that conversation, um, I should just explain a little bit more about the image that we can see on the screen here. Because the house that is the Blackton Trust, the house of the, the gable end and the window that you can see there, isn't actually the house that my father talked about discovering. It's a timber-framed house that him and my mother actually moved from 20 miles away in Staffordshire in the 1970s. And that's a whole other story. But that is the centre of the Blackton Trust, um, where we run arts events, um, tours, education events. And the central premise of the Blackton Trust is where history and creativity meet. It's where I grew up, it's where my father wrote his books. And that house that we can see the gable end of shining in the, in the sunset is also another setting of Treacle Walker. So I just have to explain that because we're going to be touching on that. And I am, I am very lucky to be sitting here with um, the history and creativity of the Trust. Tim Campbell Green, our, our archaeologist, and Daniel Morden, um, storyteller that has been a friend of the family for years. So I'd just like to begin by, by handing over to both Daniel and Tim, really, and, uh, and first impressions on the ideas that came up in the film from those different perspectives. <laughs> Do you want to go first? Well, <laughs> th there's, there's a moment in Treacle Walker that really leapt out at me. Um, it's a conversation between Treacle Walker and Joe Coppock, the protagonist. And they're sitting in a chimney, uh, at the bottom of a chimney, and Treacle Walker looks up. And it, it says, Treacle Walker leaned his head against the timber and looked up into the stack. Axis mundi. Eh? The chimney. It is the heart of all that is. The sky turns on it. It is the way between. Between what? The earth, the heavens, and the sapient stars. And he's describing the chimney, but when I read it, I was thinking about the telescope. The way between the earth, the heavens, and the sapient stars. And to put that in a context, the chimney in the house, in the old medicine house, the Blackton Trust, it runs the whole height and half of the house. So in fact, in that photograph where it's me and my father talking in the chairs, we're just sitting just outside the, the lower beam of the chimney. So it is this building that you can, you can look up and, it, and you can see these beams coming together. But the architecture of it, and you can even see it in, in that photograph, the echo between the timbers and the struts of the telescope quite something. But um, over, over to you, Tim. Yeah, I was going to say, because it is very much sitting there. It is like being in the centre of the universe. It, all kind of weird things happen. and you, you do, you, Time and space all moves. Um, what I quite like about the quote, though, if you continue, um, <clears throat> uh, Joe just responds with, no, it's for letting out the smoke. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which yeah. neatly sums up those two, two yeah. approaches, I think. Yeah. I think it's a wonderful way of putting it, that... You know, it's uh, the scientific rationalist approach versus a more visionary approach, um, which I think sums up Treacle Walker quite nicely as well. Um, yeah. But yeah, it's, uh, the, 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 the house itself is incredible and I think is the, the star of the book. Um, the story moves around it. It's the house and the land, though, as well. <laughs> yeah. You can't quite separate the two. And again, this is something that, um, that we found in the site in, in, in Blackton, just as this site here is, is ancient. Um, it shouldn't be that surprising that two, three fields away, we have some very ancient land and, and history of ancient occupation, don't we? Do? Yeah, and as we saw in the film, the 1839 tithe map is, is quite an incredible piece of data. It's, uh, it, it, it's a time just as things are becoming industrialized, and it's a snapshot of every single field in Cheshire. Each one is named, each one has the owner named, each one has the, its size, and as a consequence, you can work out how much tax is owed on each bit. Um, the telescope that we see, we saw being constructed, and if you just look out the back, you can see, uh, sits in two fields. One is called Brick Kiln Field, and the other is called Nags Pasture. Um, when they were naming the fields, they didn't do it for fun. These are a genuine reflection of... So in, in Brick Kiln Field, there was once upon a time a brick kiln. 
Uh, Nag's pasture is the pasture where the nag is. Um, it, it's, it's quite important to, to, to remember this, and it's certainly when we start dealing with the idea of round meadow, which, as was pointed out, is triangular. So there's, there's all sorts of interesting things that can be spun from that once we start picking away at it. Um, for the sake of information, we're currently sitting in a boundary of two fields. Uh, this is long field here, and about somewhere on that midline amongst you, beyond that is a field called outlet. Um, outlet suggests that there's perhaps a stream, or there was a stream there at one stage. Long field is just as the name suggests, it's the long field. Um, what's interesting then is boundaries. Yeah, yeah, in folklore, boundaries are mysterious places. They're places where the unexpected can and will happen. The normal rules don't apply. The boundaries between seasons, that's the origin of Halloween, for example. It's the night when one season has ended, but the next season has not quite begun. And so the normal rules don't apply and strange things can happen. In Welsh folklore, for example, which Alan drew on in the Owl Service, uh, one of the characters in the Mabinogion, um, in the branch that Alan draws on in the Owl Service, cannot be killed by day or by night, neither indoors nor outdoors, and he must be neither dressed nor naked. So boundaries of time, boundaries of place are, are um, powerful and strange, and the unexpected can happen. He, um, there's a, an anthropologist working in Papua New Guinea. He came up with this idea of uh, liminality, or at least its application to people and society. And um, in particular, he was looking at the, the transition that happens when boy becomes man. Uh, and in, in this society he was studying, he, he noticed that in order to transform from boy to manhood and all the benefits that brings, and the responsibilities, both positive and negative. You have to go through a series of transform transformative tasks, um, adventures in a sense. You have to prove that you are worthy. But what he noticed that as a boy, you're one thing. As a man, you're another thing. But when you're undertaking these, these tasks, when you're going through this rite of passage, um, you're neither one nor the other. And, and this is the liminal stage. As an archaeologist, we use it quite helpfully. We find it quite helpful because what we do is we, we look at, uh, for example, death and burial. And, you know, is, is a corpse, though dead, is it truly dead until it is bones? You know, this, this idea, this liminality, places can be liminal too. As I say, the, the boundary is a classic example. And liminality in itself is dangerous because it's unpredictable. If you were to stand between... Um, What's the field? Outlet and long field. If you were standing between those two points, where would you be? Because you're neither one nor the other, so you're nowhere. And it's something, again, that um, is present in Treacle Walker, and it's a very difficult book to talk about without giving away spoilers, and there are so many beautiful twists and turns and playing with um, the power of objects and the power of place. Um, that is deeply folkloric and also deeply playful, that don't want to be too specific. But suffice to say that, the, um, again, the chimney space mm. is absolutely central to the book. And it's where Treacle Walker and Joe Kopok meet and sit. And there is a moment very early on, uh, at the end of the first chapter, where something shifts. And it's the first time, I think, that you realize what that, that Joe's world is shifting and playing with these ideas of liminality and um, initiation in some ways. Um, and because they are in the chimney, they are protected. And again, this links to what is actually there in the chimney in Blackton. Yeah, it's, um, it is protected magically. Uh, um, there is a, certainly during the 17th and 18th century, there was a, a tradition of marking places, these, these liminal places, these boundaries, with markings that um, stop evil from coming in. Certainly during the 17th century, there was a very real fear of witchcraft. And it's not a, in a way that we would understand it. It's, it's, a, gen, it's a, a, a true fear of a witch causing harm to you and your belongings and your people, your family, your livelihood. And a way of protecting yourself from this would be to carve um, 
quite often we find interlocking Vs, um, crosses, there is sort of lines hacked into it. It's, a very, it's, it's They're constantly cropping up in buildings. I mean, it seems when we look for them, we find them in these boundary places. And certainly, uh, yeah, Blackdown is no different. It, is, it has a lot of them in the, in, the, in the chimney space and the doorways and the windows. And so I, I've always found it very difficult. I never want to speak for my father, but um, Tim and my father and myself quite often have these kind of conversations, don't we, around the kitchen table at Blackton. And it's very clear that Treacle Walker was coming out of these, these conversations. But as he said, the, um, the trigger also was finding that pop to the poor man's right. friend, mm. which links to a very specific folktale and folklore motif. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, um, across the world, there is this motif, this idea that a person, often by accident, smears their eyelid with an ointment and suddenly the illusion of the everyday is gone and they can see things, people, beings who are usually invisible to us. And this plays a very prominent part in, in Treacle Walker. Um, in pop culture, I'm thinking um, the younger members of the audience, it's in their Spiderwick Chronicles, the chap puts on the glasses and suddenly you can see goblins everywhere. And the older members of the audience, they live the John Carpenter movie from way back in the 80s, put on the goddamn glasses. As soon as he does, he looks up and on all the billboards, on, uh, on the buildings, instead of pictures, he just sees the word consume. And uh, he looks up at the naughty magazines in the newsagent and it, all of them say, breed, and so on and so on. And so this, this image, it, it, it's become a kind of trope, but it, it, Alan takes it right back to its origins in, in this novel. Yeah. And I think the, the final thing that we can talk about, because we'd love to open up for time, have time for questions, if people have questions, is also, this, again, it goes back to the Blackton meaning of where his, the history and the creativity meet, because there are other powerful objects within the book, and some of them echo finds that we've had at Blackton. But the remarkable thing about Treacle Walker is this sense of time shifting and looping and past and present and, and the quite often some quite mundane objects create power. But this is true to what we found at Blackton, as, as my father was saying with the gardening. Um, objects just pop up. They don't pop up in a clear timeline, but they have this really odd pattern of popping up and echoing conversations or ideas that we've been talking about. Yeah, it is quite something, working as an archaeologist, to find uh, Middle Stone Age flint implements next to early 20th century bits of pottery. In, a, in an ideal world, it would be in a stratigraphy. It would be that the older stuff would be at the bottom, the newer stuff would be at the top. Um, but it, this is a consequence of, you know, farming there for easily 3,000 years. There's been people buried there. The land is constantly being used. So it's not surprising that it's mixed up. But it is very much that moment of, you know, is, when is now? Um, and it also feeds into something like that, uh, that really it struck out, actually, on the journey down here. I was reading in the car. Um, I wasn't driving, I was being driven, which is quite nice, but I had the, the luxury of just flicking through the book. Um, and they talk about the pot. Joe says it's old. Now, it's an early, Victorian, early to mid-Victorian pot. It is, it's a wonderful thing, but it's mass-produced and not particularly interesting in itself, which I guess is the point, isn't it? Is that it is, again, it's a trope. It's this idea of the worthless being actually worth more than anything else. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, but he said, so Joe says it's old. And then Treacle Walker says, well, uh, some would reckon. And it's, you know, at what stage does something become old? When is time? When is now? When is then? And, and that, again, is a theme from the book, uh, without giving too much away. It's, it's worth reading, honestly. Yeah. <laughs> and I think what's so lovely about that as well is that these, these ideas of now and place and time um, echo the relationship that my father has had with the site mm -hmm. and with the level telescope all his life. So that little, that little bit at the start, um, where you have the strange cosmic squelching sound. That was actually a pulsar from, recorded at Jodrell Bank, 
having a chat with my father who was doing the traditional rag bone cry yeah. that is treacle walker's cry. And no spoilers, but one of the really beautiful things about the construction of, of Chica Walker is the whole story is held within the rag bone cry. So the first words of the book are the last words of the book. And again, that's quite a storytelling motif. That's a very it? storytelling motif yeah. to begin and end at the same place. And to create yeah. a place of storytelling within that. Yeah, 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 yeah. That, you know, it's the once upon a time, happily ever after. It's the sort of formula, formulaic language and bringing us back to the beginning again. Um, right. as so, ho so often happens in traditional stories. Uh, thank you very much. That was a wonderful talk and film. I read Trip Walker not so long ago, startled by that book. Mm. And I was just wondering, in, in your view, with the fluidity of time was particularly struck me from that book. Do you think Alan's interest in time not being linear predated his interest in quantum mechanics? Or was it the other way around, or was it just... <laughs> yeah. I always find these, these questions really tricky because, um, like I said, I can't, I, I, I can't talk to my father. I've been in situations where it's been encouraged, and it's like, no, the universe would crack. You've read the book, the cuckoo would come, it just would be awful. Um, but I think my father has always had a very deep relationship with time in, an, in a sense of having a sense of place. This is something that he, he's written about in his um, memoir, Where Shall We Run To? And in his book, The Stone Book, as well, of having a, a line of generations in place, a sense of geological time. And it's even there in the way that he talks about finding the house, you know, that, that, it had to, that there was something about that old place that called to him. And so I think the quantum elements is probably just an echo of that. I think he was always interested. And, and then that study evolved. So, yeah, I think it's always been part of his way of thinking. Would you say, Tim? From yeah, I mean, I think uh, your, your father's a really good example of an, a frustrated archaeologist and an excellent, uh, you know, author. Um, he's, he is an archaeologist first and foremost, I would say, um, and I've said it before, and I think he's all right with that. <laughs> um, but um, he, he has a luxury that I suppose in a sense we don't have as archaeologists he can tell a story from an object and make that story as fantastical or not as he wishes um, as an archaeologist I'm, I'm bound by a, a I wouldn't say slavish adherence to the scientific method but it's, it's a bit more we tend toward the science um, but yeah I think, I think it's an interest in, in the past however form, whatever form that takes for a since very young. Yeah. I remember you saying, um, I think you put it really beautifully, Tim, when you said that my father has the luxury of being able to give a voice to an object. Yeah, very much so. Which is also something storytellers can do, isn't it? Yeah. By giving objects a power and a purpose and a voice. And a... Yeah, I mean, uh, there's a sort of alchemy, you know, he'll take an everyday object and make it meaningful, make it, transform it into something rare and precious. <sighs> and significant. I mean, the plates in the owl service, yes. for example, he, he, he has the ability to transform something ordinary, to turn straw into gold. Yes, yeah. Any, anyone else have a question? Ah. Yes. I like this as a race of microphones. <laughs> Do I read it? Yeah. <laughs> I was interested in, in the video, your father, who talks about um, where creative writing comes from, like within and a different state of being, and that's very different to analytical writing. And that's a concept. I just wondered if you could spend a few moments elaborating on and explaining a bit further. Um, I can try. <laughs> <laughs> I think. I think my father is of um, a very specific generation. And again, he writes about this in his memoir, um, Where Should We Run To?, which was a, a group in a working class environment and was that first generation that was grammar school educated. And that was at Manchester Grammar School, in fact, the book is dedicated to, and then um, at Oxford University. And this is something that he's written about at length, so I'm really comfortable talking about this. He, he realized that academia wasn't the way that he wanted to set his mind. And he wanted to try and write a book. And I, th 
I mean, oh, it's very hard to kind of navigate this. I, I would suggest that it's writing in a way that allows creative interpretation from a reader yeah. that yeah. is specific yeah. to being, an, I mean, I, I, to being a, a, a writer, whereas academic writing is putting, is taking a reader down a, a, an argument that is going to convince them. Would you yeah. say that? Yeah, I was going to say, I think that's, it's, it's sort of harking back to what I was saying before about the idea of you can take an object and you can analyze it, you can, you can photograph it, you can measure it, you can draw it, you can give it a number, and, and as an archaeologist, that's what we do, and we tend to, we push it a little bit. So you've got the analytical side with a tiny bit of storytelling, because that's what people want. That's, after all, is what we're doing. We're interpreting the past. Um, but we can only go so far. It's, so in, in a sense, he is very analytical. It is that very Newtonian approach. The visionary comes after, that he can you know, give it a voice. He can then put a clay pipe in the mouth of a character. The clay pipe's real, the character's real, but that, that conversation we have no way of knowing whether it ever happened or not. And I think that's the, it's the key, it's the marriage of both of those that I think make it important. Yeah. I wanted to mention, in relation to your question, that the ancient Greeks had two different ways of perceiving experience. There was the mythos and the logos. And the mythos deals with meaning, with the timeless and the constant, with the intuitive, that which can only be expressed through art, through poetry, through music and ritual. The logos is the rational, the scientific, the practical, that which can be taken apart and reassembled, that which is available to logical explanation. And it seems to me that in this book, um, Joe saying, well, it's just where the smoke goes, That's it. and Treacle Walker saying, it's the, you know, it's, it's the hinge between this world and the other, and Alan, you know, sitting and listening to his relatives, uh, and then going off and being trained in another way of, you know, the sort of folk culture from which Alan came, and meeting the kind of logical and rational um, of, of Manchester Grammar School, I think also there's, and again, um, I can't recommend it highly enough, the Stone Book Quartet, if you haven't read it, it's beautiful, beautiful multi-generational um, book by my father, and it's based around All to the Edge. And it follows the line of craftsmanship through the family. So you have the, the, the sense of creativity going from stonemason to blacksmith, and my father was the first to then use words as craft. So the, it, it's two sides of the same coin, really. Um, do we have time for that one last question? No more. The, one more question. The, the, yes, say that. Hi, uh, another um, what came first question. Uh, you were talking about an anthropo anthropological concept of liminality. Yeah. How, how fresh an idea is that? Because that seems to be tended to our girls. Well. It is. I think, um, I think you can sum up Alan Gartner's work, even from... I'm struggling here, it's been a while since I read it, but even, even in the Weird Stone, his first novel, um, you know, I think the third sentence in, they talk about this, uh, the train pulling into Wilmslow Station, and it's that lost in that time between travelling and arriving, and that is a beautiful example of liminality. Um, Van Gennep, I think, was writing in the 70s, 60s and 70s, I believe. I probably should have read up on that a little more before introducing it as a concept. Um, but it, it, so it's, maybe Alan's ahead of the curve in this respect. Um, but it is, I think, you know, if not all of his works, certainly most of them can be described as in some way dealing with that, this concept of liminality. Neither one nor the other, but both. Um, and I think Treacle Walker is, is, the, is the pinnacle of that. Yeah. Okay, I think we have to, we, to finish up there, but I, may I give a, uh, another request? The books. Yes, so. the books. Um, but first, <laughs> just a, another round of applause for um, my father, Alan Garner, and also the filmmaker, Al Kenny, who got that audio, pulled all the images together, and um, created this beautiful presentation for us. And also thanks to the entire creative team that, that works at the Blackton Trust, because we're, we've, got, we've got quite a force of nature there, haven't yeah, we? Too? Yeah, So, <laughs> yes. Feel free to, to visit us, please. <laughs> feel free to visit us. Yeah. And yes, as, as Tim says, we, we do do tours. We're, 
we've got a few plans over summer. So the best place to find us is if you just look at um, the Blackton Trust. As, oh, I don't think they're going to let us put us up. <laughs> um, we've got a Twitter account. Um, you can also find, um, we've got a Facebook account. We have a website, the Blackton Trust. If Basically, I think probably if you type in where does Alan Garner live in that weird house, you will get it. But um, yes, do, do come and see us and find out more. And we'll be around somewhere around if you fancy tracking one or two yeah. of us down and you're asking awkward questions. Yeah, we, we have a books free. table over there, don't we? we can, yeah, thank you. Yeah, can I just ask you to thank again Elizabeth, Daniel and Tim for a fantastic talk, fantastic discussion, for all our questions around it. And yeah, they're going to be